Hi everyone. So what does it mean to be covered in the blood of the lamb? What does it mean to have the blood applied to your life? We're first going to take a look at the Old Testament and the Levitical laws and how blood was needed for the atonement of sins. So if we first look at Exodus 12, this is when God has called Moses to go to Egypt to the Pharaoh to let all the Israelites go. And God has sent plague after plague to Egypt, and the Pharaoh has still hardened his heart, and he has not let the Israelites go. And now we're on the tenth plague that God has said he will kill all the firstborns in Egypt. And we're going to start in Exodus chapter 12, and I'm just going to skip around different verses. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smile all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Over to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts. The Lord will pass over the door, and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. So the Lord passed over all of the houses that had the blood applied to the doorpost. And now we're going to move on to Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8. And this is when God caused Moses to meet with him on Mount Sinai. Verse 3 says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning, and builded an altar under the hill, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So Moses had read aloud to the people the words of the Lord, and they verbally agreed to be obedient to the Lord, but it still took the blood and the sacrifice to seal the covenant. Now we're going to go to the Levitical law. And that is the instructions for the sin offering. So the five major offerings were burnt offering, meat offering, sin offering, uh, trespass offering, and peace offering. And sin must be atoned for by the sacrificial offering of blood. So in Leviticus 17, 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Okay, now we're going to go over to Leviticus 8. And this is when the consecration of Aaron and his sons happen. <clears throat> so we're going to go over to verse 22. And he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram, and he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it, and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. 
And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. So if we think about that, they're literally having the blood applied to them. And we look at when the blood is applied to their right ear, so they're going to hear differently. The blood is applied to their right thumb. They're going to work differently. And the blood is applied to their great toe, so they're going to walk differently. So when we have the blood applied to our life, you know, there's going to be a change. We're going to move different, walk different, talk different. Our life is going to be different. Okay, let's go to Leviticus 16, verse 10. Okay, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now move over to verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel in all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So we know that a scapegoat is a word for someone who takes the fall for everyone else. They're blameless, but they take the fall. Now let's move over to... The Day of Atonement. So this is still in Leviticus 16. And it's... Let's go over to verse 34. And this shall be an everlasting statue unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So this is once a year. The high priest will go into the Holy of Holies and into the tabernacle and make an atonement for all of Israel, all of their iniquities, all their sins. Okay, so now we're going to go over to Hebrews 9. And I'm going to read most of the chapter because we're going to talk about the Old Covenant, and which is the law of Moses, the Levitical law that we just read. And the Old Covenant is about the animal sacrifices. Now, that was a temporary covering of the sin, but it will take a perfect sacrifice to have an eternal redemption. So let's go to Hebrews 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. We're going to move down to verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken, Every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and to all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. 
Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now we're going to go over to Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will of God. And when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that, may, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So I know that was a lot to read, but we're talking about the old covenant with Moses and how Jesus came and died on the cross and we entered into a new covenant with him. So we're talking about the Levitical law and Jesus Christ fulfilled every law, every sacrifice. If we look at the burnt offering in the book of Leviticus, let's look at Ephesians 5 and 2. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, he fulfilled the peace offering. Romans 5 and 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He has fulfilled every sacrifice, and he is the perfect Lamb of God. So, are we covered in the blood of the Lamb? We're talking about Jesus Christ. Have we accepted Jesus into our hearts because he is the perfect Lamb of God? Let's look at John 1 and 19. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Revelation 7 and 14 says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 1 John 1 and 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 12 and 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. 1 Peter 1 and 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
And Colossians 1 and 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. So we are talking about the blood of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, we have the law of Moses. We have the Levitical law. We needed the sacrificial blood for the atonement of sins. But Jesus Christ has came and he has made that once and final perfect sacrifice. And we know that everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Bible is leading up to what happens on the cross. And it's God's plan that all sin must be atoned for by the sacrificial offering of blood. And this is fulfilled when Jesus dies on the cross. So if we even look at the tabernacle that it talks about in the Bible, um, this is just a really simple, crude drawing. But even the tabernacle itself is leading to Jesus Christ. So hopefully you can see this okay. But... We have here the main altar, the sacrifice. We have the labor basin, which is now the baptism of water. We have the holy place. So we have the table of showbread, the candlestick, the veil. So used to, they would have to go through the door in the tabernacle. But in John 10 and 7, Jesus says, I am the door. They used to have the candlestick. And in John 8 and, John 8 and 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He had the showbread, but in John 6 and 35, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. So we have the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And when Jesus died on the cross, there was a tearing of the veil that is found in Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15 and 38, Luke 23 and 45. So priests were only allowed in the holy of holies, but Jesus tore the veil and ushered in a new covenant. We go through him to get to the Father, and he was the ultimate sacrifice. So, are you covered in the blood of the Lamb? No, we do not have to sacrifice animals anymore. We're not following that Levitical law. We have a better way, a more perfect way through Jesus Christ to get to the Father. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Are you covered in the blood of the Lamb? And I just... There's so many more verses that I could have read, and I hope that I'm explaining this. I just really feel, if we don't understand, if we're not reading that Levitical law, I know a lot of people struggle with the book of Leviticus and the Old Testament. It's there for a reason. It was such a, it was so much more of a, a burden and just more work honestly to have your sins forgiven and there was so much more sacrifice there was that literal killing that sacrifice that blood if we don't read that we're never going to be able to understand how much better this new covenant is since Jesus Christ has came and died on the cross everything that he did for us he did not just simply die he allowed himself to be killed and sacrificed for our sins he took the place of that old law and ushered in a new covenant a more perfect way and we really need to understand that maybe we're probably never really going to fully understand just what he has done for us but everything in the bible is there for a reason for us to read it and to dig deeper and why is that there no it's not boring it's to make you understand the better way that Jesus brought in he was the perfect lamb of God the perfect sacrifice and he died on that cross to pay for your sins yes yours and mine and everybody's so he died on that cross for you to usher in a new covenant and I think that's beautiful. I mean, that is the most beautiful thing in the world. He did not simply die for us. He did so much more for us when he died on the cross. And he loves you and I love you. And if you are not covered in the blood of the lamb, you need to be.